Hey everyone, welcome back to Wicked Deeds. We're your hosts, I'm Brittany. And I'm John. And today we'll be discussing the case of a five-year-old girl who attended a Christmas party with her mother on a freezing cold night in early December of 1989. Just as she and her mother were getting ready to leave and head back home for the night, the little girl was abducted with nearly 100 witnesses present, but it seems as though no one saw a thing. After interviewing witnesses about what transpired that night, authorities quickly honed in on their prime suspect. But would their case against him be strong enough when the girl's body had yet to be found? Today's episode is part one of The Disappearance of Melissa Brannon. Melissa Brannon was born on April 13, 1984, to parents Tammy and Michael Brannon. Melissa's parents, unfortunately, did not stay together for very long, and sometime in 1986 or 1987, the Brannons divorced, with Tammy moving into an apartment complex in Lorton, Virginia, known as the Woodside Apartments. Michael, on the other hand, moved down to Garland, Texas, where he secured a job as the manager of a toy store. In 1989, Tammy was a 27-year-old, essentially single mother to now 5-year-old Melissa, as Michael was living over 1,400 miles away, and I don't believe he saw his daughter too, too often. To make ends meet and pay for the apartment that she and her daughter lived in now for the past two years, Tammy worked two jobs, one as an accountant during the week, and the other was a side gig at a jewelry store on the weekends. Now, Melissa was Tammy's only child, even though Michael did go on to remarry and had another child at one point with his new wife. But from all accounts, Tammy was a fantastic mother who adored Melissa and built a strong bond with her. Now, Melissa was said to be an incredibly shy little girl who pretty much hung on to her mother's hip in social situations until she, you know, got acquainted and became comfortable. But she almost never spoke with anyone she didn't know. Her mom had even said at one point, quote, She was very shy. She wouldn't talk to strangers, especially men. When I took her trick-or-treating and people would give her candy, she would tell me she was too shy to say thank you, end quote. Even though Melissa was a bit timid around strangers, that didn't stop her excitement for the annual Christmas party being held at the Woodside Apartment Complex on December 3rd, 1989. I mean, it was Christmas after all, and she was going to be able to eat snacks, see Santa Claus, and stay up past her bedtime. What five-year-old wouldn't be excited for that? Now, the complex that Melissa and her mother lived in was particularly large and had several hundred residents living there. That night, it was said that anywhere from 100 to 200 people would be crammed into the clubhouse attending this party. And this kind of thing, having large resident events, was quite common for this community, and they often held these types of gatherings for holidays, but they also held smaller events nearly every week as well. So due to this, many of the residents already knew Melissa and Tammy relatively well. From what I understand, it actually took some convincing from Melissa for Tammy to get up and head out to the party that night, as she said she was a bit tired and just wasn't sure if she wanted to go. But she ended up relenting to her stubborn five-year-old's demands, and they made their way over to the clubhouse around 7.15 or 7.20 p.m. that Sunday night. Melissa was thrilled about the party, of course, but... Once she and her mom arrived, her shyness definitely came out and she hung on to her mom for most of the evening. However, she did get comfortable after a few hours of being around everyone and finally began playing with two little boys, one of which being a two and a half year old boy named Daniel. Now, that night was a bit of a late night for Melissa as her normal bedtime was around 8.30, but she and her mom didn't get ready to leave the party until about 10, 10 10.15, maybe even as late as 10.30, Her mom figured, what the heck, it's a Christmas party, she can stay up a little later than she normally would. But once it started getting too late, around that 10, 10 10.30 time frame, Tammy started to pack things up. She told Melissa to go grab her coat and get ready to go, which she did. But Melissa also took this opportunity to ask her mom if she could go grab another few potato chips before they headed out for the night. Tammy said that was fine, and off she went to grab her chips. Simultaneously, Tammy was putting her coat on and saying goodbye to several other residents, and she was watching Melissa out of the corner of her eye as she did so. 
She did see her at one point talking to someone with her chips in hand. And during that time, Tammy took her eyes off Melissa for just a minute. And by the time she turned back around, she no longer saw her daughter standing where she had been just a minute ago. Probably because it's two young kids, but I get vibes of Timothy Wiltsey. Okay. Because Timothy Wiltsey, obviously his mom, we have our own opinions on her. Mm -hmm. But uh, what was it called? A drink? Oh, what the hell oh, is that called? It was, um, that's going to bother me so bad. I got to look it up. <laughs> it was like a beverage trailer. Is that oh, what my, it was? that's exactly what it was. A yeah, beverage a trailer. beverage trailer. Yep. Yeah, yep. obviously. So again, we have our opinion on what happened there, but it made me think of, you know, young child wanting to go and do something or grab something. Yeah. And, and I would assume you're not thinking like in a bad way, how we, you know, kind of No, see. no, 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 no. Okay. I'm just thinking, you know, another case that we covered very early on yeah. where we had a small child that a parent was, you know, watching out of the corner of their eye, mm -hmm. at least allegedly in Timothy's case. And, you know, you look away for one second and they disappear. Yeah. Makes me want to, you know, put a leash on our kids when we have kids. You know? Oh my God. <laughs> I know. It's just so crazy. You know, you would think in that one minute that you turn around to like throw your coat over your shoulders and say mm -hmm. goodbye to someone, give them a hug or something. And then you turn back around like you literally just had your eye on your kid. Right. And also to think as far as Melissa's character goes, if she's very shy mm -hmm. and, you know, obviously she opened up after a couple hours of being there and she hung out with these two young kids. Mm -hmm. She's not the type to just go off with some random stranger. Yeah. So you're already thinking, Okay, did somebody snatch her? Yeah, exactly. And who did she get comfortable enough that she would be talking to? Right, if that's the case, or mm -hmm. did somebody just run up behind her, grab her, and head out? Yeah, but that's the other thing that's weird already. Obviously, I know more than you do, but just considering the fact that they are in this setting with so many people, that is a bold move. Yeah. If someone were to do that, it's not like, you know, just a, a handful of people there or something. Mm -hmm. Like, say they were at, like, I don't know, like a softball game and there were only like a few parents in the in the stands or right, something. Right, you're talking hundreds of people potentially. Yeah. You know, 100 to 200 attendees in this Christmas party. Mm -hmm. And it's in a clubhouse. It's not like it's in like this massive mansion with multiple floors and all this. Like it's just a, a small apartment complex clubhouse. They're not huge. Right, and you assume that if Melissa is going back to get a few more potato chips, there's probably a big, you know, banquet table with mm -hmm. a bunch of refreshments and foodstuffs and stuff yeah. like that. So that's probably centrally located, not mm -hmm. really near an exit, yeah. you would assume. So for somebody to grab her either while she was there or on her way there or convince her to go somewhere else with them, it's strange and it goes against her character as far as what we've learned so far. Yep. So with you saying that you know more, it does beg the question, okay, who could have convinced her to go somewhere with them? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. So at first, Tammy kind of just figured, oh, maybe she walked off in the other direction or something and she started looking around, but... Pretty soon, she realized that Melissa was nowhere in sight. And her mother later stated on a CBS program called This Morning, quote, I sent her to get her coat and she asked for some chips and she went to get them and we got up to say goodbye and I reached for my coat and she wasn't there anymore. There were at least 15 people right there within feet of where she had been and nobody saw anything, end quote. So Tammy began searching all over the clubhouse for her daughter and wasn't having any luck finding her, and she just became more and more frantic as the minutes ticked by. She began yelling for Melissa, and by that point, obviously everyone is hearing, they're, they're seeing her in this frantic state looking for her child, and now they're all becoming worried as well. Mm -hmm. No one knew where the brown-haired, blue-eyed little girl had gone, and it wasn't until someone found that a utility room down the hallway had its window wide open on a freezing cold night that the panic really struck that Melissa had vanished or potentially had been abducted. Someone finally called police to the scene to help search for the now missing little girl. How was that window described? So it was a tall window is how I understand it, but it was in like a utility room or a boiler room. It's mm -hmm. also been described as a furnace room. So you would think like some sort of like maintenance type place. Yeah. And the window was quite tall that a person essentially could have gotten out of it and or came into it or came into it. That's possible, too. But who knows if it was locked or not, if you could unlock it from the inside mm -hmm. versus being able to get in from the outside. Yep. And it was just left completely wide open. And everyone that's ever talked about this case, anyone that was there, the police, anyone that's worked on it has said it was frigid. 
that night. So it's very strange that this window would just randomly end up open. Exactly. Like you're talking at least 20 degrees outside or lower. Mm -hmm. There's no way (laughs) someone's going to leave that window open. Right. I mean, the only thing you could think about is if this is like a utility area, hopefully somebody wouldn't do this next to like a furnace or oil or gas or whatever. Mm. But if this was like a little side room and somebody wanted to go and smoke a cigarette or something, but they didn't want to go out into the freezing weather, Mm -hmm. could they have gone in there, opened the window, smoked their cigarette inside and blown the smoke out? Yeah. Could that be a reason why it's open? Yeah, I mean, it could be a reason, but Mm -hmm. it seems very strange that this window where somebody could easily come in or out of once it's unlocked is now left wide open. And there's a little girl missing. And there's a little girl missing, right, because if somebody had snuck off to smoke a cigarette or something, you'd assume that they would close the window afterwards. Exactly, yeah. Now, according to the FBI Files episode on this case, the only way to get out of the clubhouse without being seen by anyone would have been by this window in that room down the hallway. And since we're talking about the TV shows that covered this case now, I do just also want to bring up that there was a Forensic Files episode done on Melissa's case as well, and there is a slight discrepancy regarding where Melissa had been last seen and what she was doing in that episode compared to, like, other reporting on the case. So I'd mentioned that Melissa had asked her mom if she could go get some chips, and then she was seen with those chips talking to someone. Well, in the Forensic Files episode, they stated that she'd gone down the hallway near the utility room to get a drink of water at the bubbler, and that's where they believed she was abducted from. I don't know which scenario is more accurate, but I do know that the comment about getting the chips and being seen talking to someone was reported more frequently, so that's what I'm kind of going with as the more accurate story of the two, but I still felt that it was important to bring up that there has been a discrepancy, and considering the fact that this window that was open was down this hallway, who knows if maybe details have gotten misconstrued over the years, so I just wanted to bring it up. I mean, to look at them both objectively. Mm Mm-hmm. If there is the possibility that she went down the hallway to get a drink of water Mm -hmm. and it's right near this closet or utility room or whatever, Mm -hmm. it would make sense that if she's removing herself from like this large group of people that may be near the food Mm -hmm. and going down this area, that's easier for somebody to, you know, abduct her from. Mm -hmm. And then boom, they go right into this hallway, close the door behind them. Maybe nobody knows that they were in there and then out the window they go. Yeah. That makes more sense than abducting her while she's surrounded by 15 other people Mm -hmm. at, you know, the table where all the chips were and all the food was. Yeah. And then either convincing her to go somewhere when she knows that her mom's like getting ready to leave. Mm -hmm. It just makes more sense that she would have been abducted after removing herself from the the huge main area to get a drink of water, especially when it's right next to that closet. Yes. And I will say too, it's possible that both things happened. She could have gone, she could have gotten the chips, she could have talked to someone Maybe that someone was the same person that abducted her. And then he's like, oh, he or she is Mm -hmm. like, oh, do you want to go grab a drink of water? Or maybe she was like, oh, I'm thirsty. These chips are salty or something, you know, and (laughs) and just went down the hallway. And this person followed her and Mm -hmm. then just took the opportunity in that moment to take her. So Mm -hmm. I think it is possible that both things are accurate, but I just wasn't 100 percent sure. But that I did find that there was a discrepancy when I was researching this. So, yeah, it makes sense that both things could very well be true. Yeah. All right, but back to it. So at this point, everyone was thinking either someone had taken the five-year-old against her will or she'd somehow figured out how to open this window and left by herself. But for what reason? And from the very beginning, authorities did appear to be on the right side of things. They believed that a five-year-old girl did not just go wandering off and leave out of the window without anyone seeing her. So thankfully, this wasn't another of those runaway type situations with this case. Right, a five-year-old girl that... I would assume doesn't have her jacket yet. She did have her jacket. Yep. She went and grabbed hers and put it on when she was going to get the chips. Okay. Even with her jacket, she's a shy girl that clings to her mother. It's a, you know, single mother daughter relationship. That's like Mm -hmm. all she knows outside of the few kids that she hangs out with or warmed up to at the party. Mm -hmm. She's not a candidate for running away for no reason. No. And she's in kindergarten. Like, come on. She's so young. She's not going to be like, talking to a a friend or something and being like, oh, let's go leave or whatever. It just doesn't make sense. She's too young for that, I think. Right. I agree with that. I think the only way that, you know, she would choose to leave her mother is if she was tricked. Yeah. If she was like hoodwinked into believing that, you know, the presents were kept in this closet Mm -hmm. and an adult or somebody that was scheming to try and abduct her was like, 
oh, you're leaving before the present? Santa's coming to bring presents mm-hmm. or something like that. And then gets her into the closet and shuts the door and then opens the window. And then, you know, once it's just her and this person in this room, they can very easily keep her quiet with a hand over her mouth and then proceed to exit the building through the window. Yeah, exactly. And then you would think as well, obviously, if there's upwards of 100 people in here, it's going to be loud just from the noise of people talking. Mm -hmm. You're probably assuming there's music. There's a bunch of kids there. There's probably screaming. Like you're not going to hear or notice anything out of the ordinary if she tried to call for her mom or something like that, if she was tricked into being taken. Right. Very, very small chance. Absolutely. So the search for Melissa ensued almost immediately with all hands on deck as, like I said before, it was a freezing cold night in Lorton, Virginia, and they feared that even if for some unknown reason Melissa had just wandered off, that she would not be able to survive the night due to the freezing temperatures. And the Fairfax County PD was the lead investigating agency on this case, and Detective Wilden was one of the first detectives that arrived on scene. Now, the initial cursory search of the area was done by the responding officers, and they were out checking the premises within, I would say, 15 to 20 minutes of when Tammy had last seen her daughter. They unfortunately had no luck finding Melissa during that initial search. However, I do just want to bring up something that I came across in the FBI files episode regarding something that was found in this initial search. So according to that episode, there were apparently adult male footprints found outside the furnace and or boiler and or utility window where they believe Melissa was taken out of the building from, but there were no children's footprints outside that window. You would assume that this male was carrying her. He was abducting her. He's not going to be walking her hand in hand away from the building. Yep. So it makes sense that it would only be, I know they're saying male footprints i don't know how you can you know gender a uh a A footprint footprint. yeah could be a big footed woman this is true but um yeah it makes sense that there's only one set yeah i agree completely and i mean it should set off alarm bells that there are even footprints leaving from this window yes and they're not leading towards the building they're leading away from the building exactly and those footprints essentially led to this fence that had like a broken top rail And I don't know if that was like something that was already broken or was broken in, you know, this person trying to jump over it or something. Mm -hmm. But the tracks pretty much stopped after that. But based on at least how I understand it from the way this episode portrayed it, the way the tracks were going was in the direction of a parking lot past that fence. Right. So once you get to the parking lot, you're probably not going to have any more footprints because it's probably cleared from any snow or whatever. Yep. So makes sense that it stops there. Yes. Agreed. Without delay, authorities brought in additional teams to put together a massive search effort in the area, both on the night Melissa went missing and for the following several days. Over 400 civilian volunteers, many including residents of the Woodside apartment complex, joined the ranks of law enforcement officers, specially trained search teams, and military personnel in the search for Melissa Brannon. And the effort was absolutely massive and spanned upwards of 25 square miles around the complex where she disappeared from. The woods, highways, and railroad tracks were all searched during this time frame, with foot searches, helicopters, and boats all being utilized as well. The Fairfax County PD even brought in someone who specialized in search and rescue from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And authorities had stated other than Melissa herself One of the biggest things that they were looking for during their searches were her clothes that she was last seen wearing, which were described as a pink nylon hooded jacket, a navy blue acrylic sweater with a yellow applique of Big Bird on the front, a red and blue plaid cotton skirt, red tights, and black patent leather shoes with gold bows on them. Investigators did also mention that there was a fair amount of snow that had slightly hindered their search effort during this time as well. Now, the searches lasted upwards of four days, but authorities had come up pretty much completely empty during that time frame, at least in terms of the search for Melissa or any of her clothing. But at this point, I want to back up a little bit to continue discussing what else took place the night Melissa went missing, because there's actually quite a bit that I haven't told you about yet. So the officers who had first arrived on scene had been working to search the area, yes, but they couldn't just let all the guests at the party leave and not be questioned. So several officers spoke with guests that attended the party while others went door to door to speak with residents at their apartments and employees of the complex were interviewed by police as well. 
Also, in case you're curious, I'll just let you know right now, both Tammy and Michael, Melissa's parents, were completely cleared of any involvement in Melissa's disappearance literally within hours of her going missing. Michael didn't even live in the state, and police had no reason to believe Tammy had anything to do with this, and they did state as well that Melissa's abduction did not appear to have anything to do with, like, any sort of domestic issue within the Brandon family. Well, it's good to know that they were both cleared right off the bat. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any feelings that it could have been the dad coming back to abduct her or anything like that, so that really wasn't in my head already anyway. But back to the first officers on scene. Mm. That had to be brutal because you know that they had to take down everybody's name. Mm -hmm. So if you have like, you know, four or five officers that end up showing up there, they're taking down hundreds of people's information, name, date of birth, phone numbers, addresses, Yep. just that way in case somebody that was there or still there is somehow involved, Mm -hmm. they have information where they can go and follow up in the days to come. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just to put that into even more, I guess, perspective is... Not only are they now taking down at least 100 people's information, they're also searching for a missing girl. Right. Like that initial hour is probably so crucial Mm -hmm. because how far could she really get in that span of time? They're probably out there immediately saying, "Okay, we need to look for her. I would assume they would probably have like one or two officers stay in the, the clubhouse to talk to people and then send everyone else out to search to at least check the vicinity to make sure she's not around and then kind of come back? Well, I would say that at first you need to set up some type of perimeter because you now know that a girl was probably abducted. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that nobody can leave without you knowing that they're going to be leaving. Yep. Who knows how many officers their minimum manning is for that Mm. town or municipality at the time. So, I mean, if they only had four or five people and they got three exits that they got to cover to make sure that nobody leaves, Mm -hmm. they only have one other person available to go out searching for this girl. Yeah. They're probably going to call a mutual aid. Hopefully other agencies can come canvas the area. Yeah. You have detectives too, because there was a detective that came on scene. So you probably yeah. have people getting there over time as well, but right. still. But still, yeah. You are you have limited resources at the beginning when you have a venue that has hundreds of people there that you need mm-hmm. to make sure that you get all their information. Yeah, that's definitely a lot. Yeah, it's a, it's a big undertaking off the bat. As far as, you know, how could she have gone far or could she have gone very far so quickly? I mean, from what we know already, we know that the footprints of her most likely abductor Mm -hmm. ended at the parking lot or in the area of the parking lot. So you got to assume that they jumped into a car. Now you're wondering, oh, did anybody see any cars leave over the past X amount of time? Yep. And can we put out some type of bolo or APB to say, hey, anybody seeing, you know, a metallic blue four door sedan leaving Mm -hmm. the area? Let us know. We got to stop. We got to hold. We got to talk to this person, interview them and see what the deal is. So there's a lot of moving parts to something that is very swiftly developing. Yeah, absolutely. But all right, I do want to bring up the fact that there was someone who popped onto police's radar from the very beginning after officers had started questioning all of the guests at the clubhouse. And just before you talk about whoever pops into the police's radar, Mm -hmm. we're also talking about Fairfax County which is only, what, less than six months ago, dealing with Rosie Gordon's case. Correct, yes. So, just to reiterate for people, because we were sick last week, still a little sick now. Yeah, I can probably hear it in (laughs) our voices. But you have an agency that is still dealing with an unsolved homicide Mm -hmm. of a young girl, so they're on high alert from the get-go. So, they have probably interviewed a lot of shady characters that may fit the type of mo or description for somebody that may be looking to abduct another young female so i'm interested to hear who popped on their radar all right so first of all as you can imagine authorities wanted to hear about anything the guests at the party might have seen or maybe any strange behavior they might have observed and let me tell you they were all talking about one person who stood out like a sore thumb from the get-go So a 23-year-old man by the name of Caleb Hughes had made his way onto police's radar within a very short time after Melissa's disappearance. Like I said, we're honestly talking like probably within a half hour of authorities questioning people at the party. And Caleb Hughes was a maintenance man or groundskeeper for the Woodside apartment complex, and he had been at the party that Sunday night. Now, I know we haven't talked about a profile yet in this case, but for people listening 
to this episode after hearing the Rosie Gordon episode, Mm -hmm. we had a profile for her murderer. Yep. And just off of this brief description, he's kind of fitting Rosie's killer's profile. And now he's already popping up onto police's radar. Everybody's talking about this guy Mm -hmm. for Melissa's abduction. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. So... As time went on, his name soon began being reported in the media and only bits and pieces of information kind of trickled out about him. But I am going to tell you what I know happened the night of Sunday, December 3rd into the early morning hours of Monday, December 4th that concerns or involves Caleb Hughes. So, like I mentioned, pretty much within mere minutes of Melissa going missing, authorities were already onto this guy's trail. It was around 10.15 or 10.30 when Melissa had disappeared, right? And based on authorities' questioning of guests at the party, they deduced that Caleb Hughes had left the party almost at the exact same time that Melissa was found to be missing by her mother. And he's a maintenance worker. And the window that was open was pretty much a maintenance closet or a boiler room. Where a maintenance man would go. Where a maintenance man (laughs) would frequent. Yes. And on top of that, you remember how I said that Melissa was last seen talking to someone? Last seen talking to him? Yes. Wow. Last seen talking to Caleb Hughes. Some decent witnesses. Tammy is who said that she saw her talking to him. Mm -hmm. And other witnesses at the party later corroborated that statement as well. So something I was wondering before, obviously, you know, people that have malfeasance in their mind or are looking to do something nefarious was this Christmas party almost like an easy target because you know families are going, you know kids are going to be there, you know there's going to be a big hustle and bustle around there. Mm -hmm. If somebody was looking to do something bad, did they go here knowing that there was going to be, you know, so much going on that it may make it easier for them to get away with something? It's possible, but also at the same time, you're looking at like a very small window of time where no one is seeing exactly what's happening. So yes, in one respect, but also no, because I feel like it's very, very risky Mm -hmm. what this person potentially was doing, you know? Yeah, with there being so many people, you're saying? Yeah, that's how I see it anyway. But I mean, I think it could go either way. Yeah, I think it could go either way because you think about when there's a lot of people somewhere and but you have that way you have so many witnesses like potential witnesses you have so many witnesses too but you also have people that are preoccupied because they're doing their own thing Mm -hmm, that's true so it could go either way if somebody is waiting for the perfect time yeah to strike or can lure somebody away from the general population at this event who knows let's keep going with uh what's going on with caleb okay so come to find out later from those witnesses who had corroborated the story of melissa being last seen talking to Caleb, he had also been a little too close with Melissa that night and other children at the party in general. And parents of those kids had made mention that his like touchy feeliness and fondness for the kids made them uncomfortable. Like at multiple points, there were children sitting on his lap and he was just like weird. Mm. That's like the vibe that was being put out. Especially for a 23 year old man. Absolutely. And like I said earlier, Melissa was a shy child and she hung around with her mom for most of the night. But it appears as though after she started to become more comfortable and was hanging around with those other kids, that's kind of when Hughes made his way into their little circle and started chatting it up with all the kids. Mm -hmm. And if that's not already suspicious enough, in addition... Other witnesses mentioned that Hughes had made inappropriate sexual advances towards several women attending the party that night, but he was turned down by them. Interesting. Yeah. So I'm just trying to think back to the profile from Rosie Gordon's case. I think it was like 25 to 35, wasn't it? Or I think 25 so. 25 to 30. So he's like right on the cusp of this profile from Rosie's case. But something that stuck out in my mind was that he's unable to keep a relationship with somebody his own age. Mm. So if he's making all these advances towards women, you know, adults or 18 plus or maybe even older women and they're all turning him down and then he's getting touchy-feely with these kids and these kids don't know any better, that's like a perfect target for him to take advantage of. I agree, but I'll flip it upside down for you because he's married. It doesn't matter. That's a facade. No, no, no. But what I'm saying is... That doesn't essentially oh, match I get up with what the you're profile. Saying, because the profile said that he couldn't keep a relationship going with somebody around his same age. But was his wife around the same age? I believe so. I'm not 100% no. sure. I would like to know a little bit more about their dynamic. But, I mean, there are other factors 
with that profile. And we said last time when we were talking about Rosie's case that not every profile can be 100%, 100% of the time. Yep. So, you know, you give and you take and some things are matching up. And I think there is overwhelming evidence with the strange closeness that this guy had with these children that he had, you know, unwanted sexual advances towards all these women at the party. Mm-hmm. And he mind you, he's seen... married. He's married. Why? Why <laughs> right. are you doing this? Right. But he was last seen talking to Melissa. Yeah. So, I mean, there are so many things that are just pointing towards this guy being responsible for her abduction. Yeah. And back to what you were just saying, how he's married. Where was his wife at the time? So she was at home. Come to find out she was actually four months pregnant at the time. Mm-hmm. They also had, or I think she had a child and that was like Caleb's stepchild. I, I believe it was a son. And she said that she didn't go to the party because she had to get up early for work the next morning. So she didn't want to be out too late. Interesting. I would assume that their marriage is not great. <laughs> you know. We'll find out more about that as we keep going with this yeah. story. But if you already think that this situation and the little bit of information I've given you is weird, you better hold on to your pants, man, because <laughs> this is going to get wild. All right, let's keep going then. So after it was discovered that Hughes had left the party when Melissa went missing, some of the residents of the Woodside Apartments even called his home around 1030, 1045, and they were calling because they were trying to find him to ask him if he knew anything about what happened to Melissa because they knew that he had most likely been the last person to speak with her or at least see her. Mm -hmm. Did the wife pick up? Yes, they ended up reaching his wife who said that he wasn't home yet, but that didn't seem like totally out of the ordinary. It wasn't like he lived half a mile down the street. He lived almost eight miles away. So over the course of the next several hours between 1030 and 1 a.m., There were, I believe, three calls made to the Hughes residence, whether it was either guests of the party or authorities that were trying to get in touch with Caleb. And every time they were not able to locate him, they just kept reaching his wife. I mean, unless she's totally oblivious, she must be like, what the hell is going on right now? She wasn't thrilled. (laughs) It seems like she was quite annoyed. (laughs) Yeah. So I do know that she and this comes out later, but she did end up calling like a bar he would frequent i think she called his dad Mm -hmm. so she was trying to find him during this time at least that's how i understand it so Mm -hmm. so if he lived eight miles away Mm -hmm. was this i'm still trying to gather like what's going on with this christmas party yeah was this like a community christmas party open to the public no 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 no. he worked there so it was like employees and residents so he worked as a maintenance person Mm -hmm. at the apartment complex yes that's why he was there. He wasn't, you know, a maintenance worker at some other place and just heard about this and was like, no, oh, no, I'm no, going to no. go to this party. <laughs> no, he worked so, there. So he did have some type of connection there. Okay. Yeah, exactly. All right. Which, just to reiterate, now knowing that he works there or solidifying that he works there and that Melissa went missing from like a maintenance closet, essentially, mm-hmm. he should have intimate knowledge of the grounds there, which lend even more credence to say, okay, this guy is the one that took her. Yeah, I agree. Finally, though, between 1 and 1.30 a.m., my source material kind of differs on that time frame, Caleb Hughes ended up calling the Fairfax County PD or potentially even the Woodside Apartment Clubhouse back sometime after he'd arrived home that night. And according to a piece in WUSA 9, police stated, quote, he was very agitated, very upset that the police were bothering his wife and why we were calling. He couldn't understand why we were calling his house, end quote. Uh... (laughs) <laughs> so it's so <laughs> dumb idiot. it's so dumb so authorities came to his home within the next couple of hours to ask him a few questions about what had happened if he knew melissa if he had seen her all those pertinent and important questions so when investigators had arrived at hughes's house in the early morning hours of december 4th 1989 they discovered several strange things first and foremost hughes pretty much had no alibi for the past two and a half to three hours prior to when he'd gotten home What he ended up telling police was that he left the party alone and on his drive home, he decided to stop and pick up a six pack of beer. From there, the drive home shouldn't have taken him very long. Like I just said a few minutes ago, his home was only about eight miles from the apartment complex. And even if he took this detour and maybe went a little bit further out to get to a store where he could buy this six pack, it shouldn't have taken him all that long to get back home. 
And if you remember, he left the party around 1030, the same time that Tammy was frantically searching for her daughter. Right. It's not going to take three hours to get home. Exactly. So you probably would have expected him to be home by like what? Maybe 11.15 at the very latest? Yeah. 45 a, minutes? Yeah. Especially because he doesn't have an alibi. You could have guessed like, oh, well, maybe he stopped at like a strip club or something or... Or that bar that bar. his wife was calling. Exactly. Right. So he could have made another stop somewhere. But if he has no alibi and nobody can attest to where he has been for the past three hours, mm -hmm. he's in trouble. Oh, yeah. And as we know, he didn't call the police back until around like 1, 1 in the morning and his wife had gotten several calls between that 10.30 and 1.30 time frame looking for him. And according to her, he still hadn't been home. Right. And that was based on her earlier accounts. But it was later stated by his wife that she believed Caleb may have gotten home around 11.20, maybe 11.30. Mm -hmm. But spoiler alert, this was just her assumption, as she did later state that she didn't actually physically see her husband in the house until around 12 20 a.m but if she's getting phone calls and she's answering the phone and she's even giving a cursory glance around the apartment or the house or she whatever, wasn't that's the thing she said she was in her bedroom yeah right so police are calling you asking for your husband and you don't get up out of bed to look for him that's an excellent question and one that is definitely going to be asked later i promise right so I'm sure you're probably curious, what's Hughes's reasoning for why it would have taken him two and a half to three hours to get home after he left the party, mm -hmm. right? Sure. His reason was because he, quote unquote, took the long way home and drove slowly, which I just, <laughs> oh my God, I had to research this. I Googled, exactly. How long does it take to drive eight miles going 25 miles per hour? Because to me, that's pretty slow. Yeah. Do you know how long it would take to drive eight miles going that speed? Eight miles at 25 miles an hour. John's going to do quick math or something in his head right now. <laughs> well, 25 miles in 60 minutes. So if you do eight times three is 24. So you're probably looking at what, 20 minutes? 19 minutes. Good, <laughs> good math. I can't even add five. So here we are yep. showing the difference in our relationship. But so then I'm thinking, so he's saying he's driving slowly. What is he driving? One mile an hour? He doesn't even have his foot on the pedal. He just has it in drive. It's neutral. He's <laughs> just going down a hill. Like, what? What is this? Oh, my God. So, of course, police didn't like that story very much, and they were totally questioning him from the second they knew about him. And this was just adding to those suspicions. And especially because he literally couldn't tell them where he was or what he was doing during this time frame other than getting this six-pack and driving slowly. And like John said, there is nobody to account for him. So... I would assume to us, that's not an alibi. Did he even get the six pack? I think so. But it does actually come out later that apparently they stopped selling beer in Virginia after midnight back in 89. So it's totally possible that like this timeline is like even more screwed up than he's yeah, like making right. it out to be, right? Unless he drove, are they like on the border of another state? Could he have drove to another state to get it? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't know. Bad story so far. Or yeah. bad, uh, bad alibi, at least. Exactly. So all in all, the story is not making sense. But what's even wilder than the lack of an alibi is Caleb Hughes's behavior after he got home that night and before he called the police back. And then also his reasoning for that behavior. He took a shower. He burned his clothes. <laughs> well, OK, so it gets <laughs> it gets interesting. So according to investigators, they discovered something very unusual when they arrived at Hughes's house that night. After he'd arrived back home around, let's say, let's give him the benefit of the doubt here, say 12.30 a.m., right? Mm -hmm. He'd apparently decided to do a load of laundry. Okay, I mean, maybe it's not the weirdest thing ever. I mean, I wouldn't do it. But according to Carol Hughes, Caleb's wife, this was normal for him. And according to Caleb, this was normal because he only had one pair of jeans that he wore regularly and he needed to wash his clothes because he had to work the following morning. And I do just want to note, since we're on the topic of his clothes, it was said that Caleb was the most underdressed person at the party that night. Like everyone was dressed up. You heard what Melissa's outfit was. She's in right. a, a cute skirt and tights and nice patent leather shoes. And he's there in like dingy jeans and like a, a T-shirt, you know, that probably haven't been washed in a while. So I'm sure he didn't need to wash them when he got home. You're right. Exactly. But not only did he wash his clothes, but authorities found that he had also thrown his belt, which held a knife sheath on it. And his sneakers into the wash as well. Jeez. And by the time authorities had gotten to his home, and honestly, by the time his wife had noticed anything regarding the laundry, these items were already in the dryer. 
So at that rate, he'd already washed the clothes and the shoes and the belt and the knife sheath Mm -hmm. and had enough time to switch them over to the dryer. Which is probably at least 40 minutes. Super convenient, right? And it's really weird that you say 40 minutes because that's literally in my next (laughs) sentence because his wife did later mention that it took about 40 minutes for the washing machine to run. So if this is true, he had waited that long to ensure he could move everything over. It did a full cycle. Mm Mm-hmm. And then before calling anybody back. Exactly. But how would he even know to call anybody back unless his wife told him? And how would his wife not realize that he's home taking his clothes off? He's coming into the house. He's doing laundry. She claims that she didn't see him until 1220 a.m. And that he could have been home for upwards of 40 minutes before that. Okay, but she saw him at 1220 and she must have told him that police were calling for him. Yes. And he waited for another hour to call them back. That's what it seems like. And at that point, I believe he had already at least started the laundry. Mm -hmm. The timeline just doesn't, doesn't flow here. It's not jiving for me. Okay. But if you thought that was it, it is not. Caleb had also apparently cut pieces out of his sneakers. It was mentioned in multiple different articles that he had cut these pieces out. Now, some sources did state that he essentially like filed off the edges of the soles of his shoes. Why? So they wouldn't match... The footprints left in the snow? No, it's it's Even way dumber. more than it's more than that. And then there were some other sources that said he like cut chunks out of them. Regardless, it's super sketchy. What reason would you have to be cutting parts of your shoes off in the middle of the night? Like there's nothing that he can say that's gonna make sense. Right. Right? So John, I actually do have a picture of his shoes for you so that you can take a peek. This was in, I think, the FBI files episode on the case. It was either that or forensic files, but Is he wearing new balances? You wait, man. Close. What are those? <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. He's even a Velcro guy. Yeah. So I screenshotted those from the YouTube video because I couldn't find any other pictures. But those are friggin hideous. Yeah, they're not cute, but they're also probably all scrunched up and weird like this because, because they the were dryer. thrown in the dryer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. These are like uh department store brand. This is like a Walmart Velcro shoe. shoe. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this was the point now when authorities were like, all right, we need you to come in. And they brought him to the station and they began questioning him. Mm -hmm. So when he was brought in for questioning, he'd apparently provided conflicting statements to police about where he'd been that night, what his quote unquote alibi was. And he'd even supposedly lied to authorities about knowing who Melissa was and even talking to her at the party, which, mind you, there were so many witnesses that saw him talking to her, that saw her on his lap, that like saw all these things. So Mm -hmm. it's not like... This is a he said, she said. This is a he said and 40 other people said (laughs) type situation, you know? And overall, from what I understand, he was just being completely uncooperative with police. And on the other hand, his wife did seem to be answering authorities question with no issue. So I don't know, you know, she seemed to be fine with talking to them. And obviously Mm -hmm. he was like, no, I'm all set. I'm going to be difficult. Well, back to how I'd said, I bet their marriage isn't great. Mm. She's probably like, okay, this guy's up to no good. Mm-hmm. I don't care that I'm married to him. I don't care that I have his child in me right now. Mm-hmm. I'm not getting wrapped up into whatever bullshit he's pulling right now. Yeah, I mean, it could go one of two ways. Who knows? We'll find out more later. Yeah, well, I mean, not everything is always what it seems to be. This is true. So if she is answering questions and stuff like that, maybe, you know, she's answering them, but maybe she's not being truthful with her answers. Yeah, which we'll find out more as time goes on. Mm-hmm. It was also said, and I think this was the exact word that authorities used to describe him, but that he was being smug during his questioning. And when authorities told him that they believed he was the person who abducted Melissa, he just like dead stared back at them and said something along the lines of, prove it then. Interesting. Like, woof. I mean, they have a lot of evidence already. Yes. And it hasn't even been 24 hours. Yes. So that's ballsy to say. It sure is. Now, Caleb was also given a polygraph, which I know, I know, they're not super reliable, not admissible in court. But according to early reporting on this case, he had apparently failed that polygraph and actually walked out of the exam when the examiner told him that he was failing it, which I don't really know why they would tell him in the middle of the polygraph like Mm. that. But I mean, it was 89. So who knows? Yeah. Also, The FBI had gotten involved in Melissa's case pretty much from the very beginning. And within the first couple days after she'd gone missing and investigators had questioned Hughes and, you know, given him the polygraph and all that, the FBI actually issued a search warrant for both his home and vehicle, which was a red Honda Civic. It makes sense that the FBI is already in on this because FBI were the ones that created the profile for Rosie Gordon's case. Mm -hmm. These are two young girls that one was killed, another's missing within six months of each other. Yep. So it's like, hey, 
let's get them back in here real quick because maybe this is the same person that killed Rosie that has now abducted Melissa. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's absolutely valid. And John, I'm also going to send you a picture now of what Caleb Hughes' car looked like, just so you have a visual. Okay, that's what I expected when you described it. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> What were we just watching the other day? The X-Files. Oh, my God, the X-Files. Oh, we have to talk to everyone about the X-Files. So, Brittany has a new love. Let me back up. Yeah, back up and say we both have a new love. What's wrong with you? Well, I wanted to say that for the longest time, you would not watch anything that was older than, like... Five years. 2010. Yes. I've slowly broken down your barrier, and now you have a love for all things media-related from, like, the 90s. The 90s is my go-to. So... We recently started watching The X-Files. And, and if you follow us on social media, you know about this already. You already know. You're in the know. <laughs> right. And we were talking about how we like that there's consistency, how like every time Mulder and Scully end up going to a different location, they're always driving a rental. Mm. And I was just thinking about how there was one rental that they were driving. I think it was in the episode where the girl was being protected by the spirit mm. and the spirit like throws mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. car in reverse. I could be wrong, but you were like, oh, the red interior. Oh, it definitely was that one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it just made me think because this is, you know, the maroon car with the mm-hmm. red interior. But yes, the Complete X-Files. Complete total crazy aside there. Mm-hmm. But The X-Files. We're watching from episode one all the way through 200 and change. And if you want to watch with us, if you haven't, please do. And just like comment on our Instagram post because I want to know what you think of the X-Files. Yes. All right. So anyway, back to it. Authorities also had Hughes provide blood and hair samples to be analyzed in the case around the same time that the FBI had issued the search warrant. But regardless of Hughes failing the polygraph, a search warrant being issued, and all the sketchy stuff authorities discovered about Hughes the night that Melissa went missing, they still had practically nothing to hold him on, and they unfortunately had to let Caleb Hughes go. I'm wondering if there were a couple things that maybe they could have done in these early stages to hold him longer, namely those footprints leaving the window. Mm -hmm. Could they have cast those prints and then compared them to his shoes or at least his shoe size? Mm. And then also, did they try to dust for prints on any of the windowsills in the area of the, uh, the window that had been opened that he presumably abducted Melissa through? Yeah, so it's interesting that you bring that up because... I believe either of the two like programs that covered this case, either FBI files or forensic files, one of them was the one that mentioned the footprints and either both of them or one of them had mentioned dusting for fingerprints around the window. Yeah. But there just was not a lot of official reporting at the time Mm -hmm. of the case going on about like any of that stuff. So I don't know, first of all, how accurate it is because there wasn't. I mean, again, we're still within 24 hours of yeah. the abduction. I mean, we're within six hours of the abduction. Honestly, yeah. And there's just, there wasn't a ton of reporting, even within like the first couple weeks, about mm-hmm. things that authorities were doing because they were keeping it hush-hush. Because like I said, things trickled out about Caleb Hughes in the media, mostly because things were getting leaked when they shouldn't have been. Mm-hmm. But there wouldn't have been anything that would have come out at that point For me to like verify and say, okay, this is what was going on and all of that, because you have to consider, you know, it's an open and active investigation for them at that time. And there are things that they're just not willing to tell to the public. Mm -hmm. So for all we know, maybe there was a flub. Maybe they forgot to cast the prints. Maybe the footprints didn't match. Maybe he wore gloves. I mean, he was a maintenance man. Maybe his gloves were literally right in the room and they couldn't find prints. Mm -hmm. So I don't exactly know what happened with fingerprints and or footprints. I can only assume that whatever it was, wasn't good enough to hold him on. Yeah. And I mean, that's fair. We are still talking the very early stages of an investigation. Yeah. Just because they don't have enough to hold him for an extended period of time does not mean that they are no longer looking at him once he leaves the station. Exactly. Now, we're going to move on for a bit and discuss some other things that were going on in the case in the first few months after Melissa disappeared. And then I do promise we will circle back to Caleb Hughes again and talk a bit more about what was going on with him and his potential involvement in this case, especially considering the fact that there had been a search warrant and samples to test that had been taken from him. But okay, so in terms of what the community was doing in their attempts to help find Melissa, there was a lot. Fairfax County really banded together and pushed to try and bring Melissa home, and that included Rosie Gordon's parents. We had talked about Rosie a few times already in this episode, and her family knew the struggle, and they came to support Tammy Brannon in her time of need. 
Locals were also putting up yellow ribbons on trees all through the area to show their support for Tammy and Melissa. And many in the area also resonated with Tammy's devotion as a mother. And it seemed like this case just affected residents even more because of that. Now, within the first several weeks after Melissa had disappeared, there was a video of her that was being shown everywhere. And that included local movie theaters and all over the news. It was a video of her singing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and her grandfather had taken this video just a short time before she was abducted. And that video became so well-known and synonymous with this case, and it's something that appears to still be etched in people's minds to this day when they hear the name Melissa Brannon. There was reporting done on this particular video as well, and there was this woman named Vivian Schaefer who worked for a cable station at the time. It was Arlington Community Television, which was on Channel 33 in the area. And she'd mentioned how a video was a better way of helping people to recognize Melissa because it wasn't just this still image of her. It was as she was and how she would look as she was moving or talking. And authorities and the public were hoping that a video instead of just a still photo would be more helpful in finding her. And something interesting I stumbled across in my research was that at the time they were like putting together little videos like this for the surrounding community's families in case the unthinkable ever happened to them too. And there was this UPI piece published in the Richmond Times Dispatch that stated, quote, Arlington County Police have agreed to join Arlington Community Television when it sets aside five hours of studio time February 3rd for videotaping the children. Parents can bring their own half-inch videotape or buy one from the studio, Schaefer said. County police will also be on hand to make fingerprint records of children if parents desire. Schaefer said if parents discuss the activity with their children, it can be done in a fun, unthreatening manner. Everybody we talk to is really excited about the idea, said Ms. Schaefer, who said the videotaping will become a yearly project if there is demand from parents. The program will be publicized through church and civic groups, schools, and paid advertising, end quote. Now, the community also put together these Bring Melissa Home for Christmas bumper stickers, which were distributed to the residents, and it was actually a local mom who came up with the idea, and then a local printing company had agreed to make the bumper stickers for free to show their support for the Brannons. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children had also become involved, as mentioned before regarding the searches, but they were also distributing flyers with Melissa's picture on them and details of her case throughout Virginia and Arkansas, and later across the United States. And as you can imagine, around this time, the community was just reeling. As we know, five months prior, 10-year-old Rosie Gordon had been abducted and murdered, and now Melissa Brannon had been abducted and still hadn't been found. And money had been raised by community members, with a reward of upwards of $100,000 being offered for information that would lead to Melissa's safe return, like literally within a week of Mm -hmm. her going missing. That's huge, too, especially for the Times. Absolutely. And I guess there were at least two anonymous donors who just gave like tens of thousands of dollars Mm -hmm. to this cause, which I thought was awesome. And just obviously considering all these other people that are just even donating like a dollar or something to help this cause was really powerful for like that whole Fairfax County area to come together like that. So definitely. Even though the community was supportive of the Brandon family, it did appear as though the media was running with a lot of speculation and rumors And they were printing things that might not have been particularly helpful to the case. And some of that even included information that was leaked about Caleb Hughes, like I had mentioned earlier. I'm surprised that people weren't, you know, getting their torches and pitchforks ready and hanging out out front of his house. All the media did. Well, I mean, also you think you had 100 or 200 people in attendance to the Christmas party. Mm -hmm. And all these people, I guess, not all 100 or 200 of them, but yeah. several of those people know about him and then word travels and mm-hmm. he was the last person seen with Melissa and all these sketchy things that people saw throughout the night. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you want to search and you want to find her and you want to provide any other aid that you can in order to assist in helping her. But when you have this suspect mm-hmm. that seems to check so many boxes, I'm surprised people weren't, you know, out for blood. Yeah, I don't know for sure if they were or were not, but... You know, of course, people still had the hope that she could still be alive. Right. Maybe all of this was a horrible coincidence. And Mm -hmm. obviously, you know, looking hindsight, we can see things just aren't adding up. But there's probably a lot of stuff that was not put out to the public at that point that people just didn't know about regarding him and what had happened after the fact and all of that. Mm -hmm. So it's very possible that. Some things were being leaked, but people just didn't know enough about what transpired later Mm -hmm. for them to get their pitchforks and everything and come out and 
and be even more upset about it. And of course, you have to think like even her mom had to have so much hope. Mm -hmm. Like she hasn't been found. She could still be out there. Yeah. So I just think like this guy worked there. Mm -hmm. They have a bunch of residents that were there that saw him with her. You know, police are trying to track him down. It's just word spreads and people talk shit. And you would think that the next time he shows up to work, if he did show up to work, Mm. people would be like, what'd you do to her? And, you know, just go after him for it. But like you said, we may be in a privileged position where we know a lot more than people at the time knew. Yeah. They may have seen him with her around that time and stuff, but they don't know all these strange things that he did throughout the night Mm -hmm. where he's cleaning his clothes and cutting his shoes and all that stuff. You know, that's stuff that they probably didn't know, whereas if they did at the time, maybe things would have been different. Yeah, agreed. Now, even though Caleb hadn't been charged or even publicly named as a suspect, the media was pretty much leaking everything they heard about this guy. And, you know, they were talking about the polygraph. They were talking about things that could have potentially been found in the searches, like all this stuff. But I do just want to say, you know, obviously the media is, quote unquote, leaking this stuff. But in the search warrant that was issued by the FBI, Hughes was named as a suspect in it. Right. And that's a court document that ended up becoming public record. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Are they really leaking anything? Yeah. Are they? I don't know when it became public record. Maybe they heard it from an anonymous source. Mm -hmm. I don't really know. But yes, they didn't want to put it out publicly, but it was the truth. Yeah. It's not like they weren't naming him because they're like, no, he's just a person of interest. We're not that like you know, right, when honed the judge, in on him yet, but... Right, when the judge signed the search warrant, mm-hmm. he was named as a suspect in the search warrant from what you're saying. Yeah. And that's enough. Like, if the judge yeah. was like, okay, yeah, I'm going to sign this, they're not just going to sign it all willy-nilly. No, of course not. They need to come forward with good facts and circumstances of the cases to lead this judge to believe that there's probable cause that this guy may have been involved in the crime. Yep, 100%. Police were also criticizing the press for reporting speculative details about the case. And like we were just talking about a minute ago, the whole pitchfork thing, you know, (laughs) staking out the house. The media did stake out his house and they hung out out there for a while. Sir, I'd like to ask you a question. What do you have to say about the disappearance of Melissa Brennan? Yeah, pretty much. And it seemed like this could have been a bit of a hindrance because simultaneously, while the media is, you know, hanging out around his house. Police are probably trying to track his movements and see what the hell he's doing exactly the fbi was surveilling him 24 7 so they're like great now we have to field reporters while we're also watching this guy and seeing what he's going to do next all of that Mm -hmm. and i don't know how relevant this is but like i know you like to know you know descriptions of places and stuff like i think i had described the apartment complex in that community to you relatively well Mm -hmm. this wasn't a bill sprout and mary petri case where you know it's it's a converted it's a house, house turned into an apartment. Yeah, this is a complex. And Caleb Hughes didn't just live in like a single family home or something. He lived in a town home. Mm-hmm. So like an attached house in some sort of community. So, mm-hmm. you know, you've got the media, you've got the FBI, you've got everyone out here. And then you also have like all these other people living in this area as well, like literally right on top of him. So. Right. And as far as the hindrance to the FBI's investigation when they're trying to, you know, track this guy and watch his movements and things like that, he's not going to be acting the same way while he knows reporters are following his movements and trying to ask him questions and he's mm-hmm. always under scrutiny there. Whereas if reporters weren't outside his house and the media wasn't always trying to get a word in or, mm-hmm. you know, get him to say something or put out a statement, yep, he would probably be acting much different. So that could totally impact the FBI's whole case or any investigator's whole case yep. as far as, you know, let's see if he's going to go about his day as he normally would. Or is he acting weird? Is he going to stop by this location that he really has no reason to be at? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, maybe he went there with Melissa or whatever. Caleb is going to be a totally different person when he knows the spotlight is on him Mm -hmm. than he would be after, you know, just walking out of the polygraph and the search warrant being conducted and it is what it is. Yeah, agreed. So. At one point, too, there had even been reports that Melissa's body had been found, which was completely inaccurate. And Tammy Brannon had mentioned how unhelpful rumors like that were because she felt like if people believed Melissa was dead, that they would just stop trying to look for her. Mm -hmm. Like that's a huge hindrance to things. Right. And there were tips and leads coming in around this time regarding people who felt like maybe they saw something that Melissa could have been wearing the night she went missing. There were a couple reports specifically about something that was pink that may have been seen on the side of the road. She was last seen in a pink jacket. So tips and stuff like that were coming in, but unfortunately, none of those really panned out. 
And there were some sightings from states like Arkansas that had come into authorities during this time as well. But again, nothing seemed to pan out to be able to at least find Melissa or anything that belonged to her when she was taken out of the clubhouse that night. Mm -hmm. Now, before we move on, there was one other thing that I wanted to bring up that I thought was really important. And I think it really goes to show just how crucial it can be for parents to instill this stranger danger thing into children from a young age. And as much as you don't want to scare your kids, I say as a person who isn't a parent, but I personally think it is so important to do whatever you reasonably can to keep them safe. I mean, Melissa barely ever talked to strangers because she was so shy and this still happened to her. So again, I just think it's something that's important to reiterate. So I read this powerful statement in a piece written for the Associated Press, which was printed in the Roanoke Times. And the author of this article was talking about how this family she'd interviewed kind of, you know, knew Melissa. They knew she had gone missing and they were trying to take the proper precautions to keep themselves safe. It stated, quote, they also had been taught at school and at home long before Melissa vanished to be wary of strangers and to scream and run if someone tried to grab them. I'd scream and kick him in the shins, declared Joseph. But when a reporter they had never met knocked on their apartment door, the two flung it open with a cheerful, hi. They left it wide open as they raced to get their mother. Being wary of strangers is a lesson that takes time to seep in, end quote. Yeah, this is very true. I mean, it's... uh. It's different if you're out at a playground and somebody comes up and they start to talk to you or they try to grab at you or something versus, you know, somebody in a disguise knocks on your door and says, oh, hey, are your parents home? Mm -hmm. It's like as a kid, you don't think about the different scenarios that you could be in where somebody's trying to take advantage of you or abduct you. It's like, oh, okay, I don't know this person. They're right in front of me and they're doing something weird. Stranger danger Mm -hmm. versus, oh, somebody rang the doorbell. Somebody knocked on the door. They could be in a police uniform. They could be in an electrician's uniform and they can think this person is so like innocuous and they're like, Mm -hmm. oh, they're just here to help us. Right. But in reality, it could be for a nefarious reason. And as much as you don't want to scare your children and say you need to be worried because every single person you encounter that you don't know can take you. Mm -hmm. You also have to like express to them, I guess, in a different way that, yes, anybody could be out to get you. And you do need to be careful if you've never met this person take the proper precautions to, I guess, vet them in your own like nine-year-old way, you know? And I mean, it's a difficult thing to instill into children, but it's also a difficult thing to instill into adults too because like me, I'm the type of person that I'll just answer the door. Mm -hmm. But if something were to happen, I can probably handle myself one way or another. Yeah. Now you see videos online all the time and this goes, you know, not to just the parents that are trying to do the stranger danger, but also watching out for yourself. You see all these people that, you know, somebody comes and knocks on the door, they open the door And they start a conversation with somebody. Maybe they're selling some type of electricity or they're doing solar panels or whatever. And then all of a sudden, their accomplices come running in and it's Mm -hmm. a friggin' home Mm -hmm. invasion. Yep. They come around the corner because you never saw them. Yes. You know, it's you don't want to live your life scared all the time, but you need to be aware that these things do happen. Absolutely. So get yourself a ring camera and inside the door through the I was literally just going to (laughs) say the ring camera has been the best thing. And if there's someone sketchy that comes to the door there, I remember specifically there was one time that someone came to the door with a pizza and I was like, oh, no, no, (laughs) I'm not going to open that door. And I just literally talked through the microphone on the ring. Like, obviously, I'm in the house. They know I'm in the house. Like, (laughs) my car is here, but I'm not going to put myself in that uncomfortable position because I am just a nervous person. Like, that's my nature. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I... What would I do There's no if difference. I didn't have a ring camera? Right. There's no difference saying through the ring camera, oh, hey, I didn't order a pizza. That must be our neighbors versus opening the door. Because when you open the door and then people come running around the corner and they force their way into the house, mm-hmm. they're more likely to force their way into the house once the door is open then, versus busting the door down or trying to bust the door down. Exactly. So, yeah. So just something to think about because... You know, we talked about locking your car, locking your windows, Mm -hmm. but also you never know what type of shit somebody's trying to pull or if, you know, as times are getting crazier in the world and people are being pushed to their limits financially and morally, it's something that you want to not become a victim because of a lapse in judgment. Yeah. And I just think it's one of those things, you know, we don't talk about it in every episode, but I think it's always important to reiterate it here and there because... You don't want to become a victim. Yeah, we do get lazy. 
All right, so let's fast forward about two months from the date of Melissa's disappearance to February of 1990. By this point in the investigation, authorities stated, quote, we have absolutely no evidence to prove that she was abducted, but we believe Melissa was a victim of foul play, end quote. Despite that belief and the statistics that show an abducted child is usually killed in a short span of time after they're kidnapped, Tammy Brannon still had hope that her daughter might still be alive. And in February of 1990, Tammy received a phone call that made her believe it was possible that Melissa was still alive. She received a ransom call on Wednesday, February 14th, 1990, from a man who was demanding $75,000 from her and stated that he would safely drop Melissa off at a local police station once they received the money. But the caller did threaten that they would harm Melissa if Tammy didn't oblige and provide them with the funds. You think that somebody that is calling you, offering up your daughter for ransom, is then going to deliver her to a police station? Yeah, that's pretty dumb. Right. If something seems off, it probably is off. Agreed. But, of course, Tammy was still hopeful that her daughter could still be alive, and she wanted to do whatever she could to get her back. But, thankfully, she did have a healthy level of skepticism, and she called authorities, including the FBI, immediately to let them know what had transpired. By the time a second call came in the following day providing instructions to Tammy on where to bring the money, the FBI was monitoring that call. Here's what an article published in the Daily Press stated happened next. Quote, An undercover agent went to the address and was met by a courier who took a package from the agent, a court affidavit revealed. Agents then followed the courier and another vehicle seen in the vicinity of the drop-off point to a Howard University dormitory. Police then stopped the courier and the two occupants of the vehicle, end quote. So it turned out that two young men who attended Howard University were involved in this ransom demand. 24-year-old Anthony McRae, who was from Canton, Michigan, and 20-year-old Emmett Greer, who was a sophomore at the college and was from Detroit, Michigan. After authorities looked into these two a bit more, they determined that neither man had any involvement with Melissa's abduction, and this was strictly an extortion scheme. Melissa's grandfather said of the men who did this, quote, people who prey on a tragedy are about as low as the people who would do it in the first place, end quote. I would say it's hard to believe that they'd be even lower, but yes, I agree with his statement. It's so messed up. It's so messed up. I hope that they were charged and I hope that they spent time in jail. Yeah, so Anthony McRae actually had a previous drug conviction out of Illinois, and he was on probation at the time of this incident. So both he and Greer were held in prison. Greer was held on $100,000 bail, and I believe McRae was held without bail as they had to hold him for, I think it was a minimum of 10 days, mm -hmm. while they alerted Illinois of what had happened and then kind of determined what to do for his probation violation. Yep. Greer did end up released from prison on $10,000 personal recognizance and was sent back home to be with his family. Now, a bit more information came out about Emmett Greer in particular in reporting on this matter, and apparently he came from a good family, had been an honor student back in high school, was a good kid with essentially no criminal history, and his father was even a sheriff's deputy back in Wayne County, Michigan. Both Greer and McRae ended up charged with a multitude of different crimes, which included, quote, conspiracy, use of interstate communications in aid of racketeering, interstate travel in aid of racketeering, possession of ransom money, and a threat to use violence, end quote. Based on all of the charges, both men had the possibility of receiving very heavy sentences for their wicked deed. Now, it was later reported that the whole thing was supposedly McRae's idea, and Greer's father said his son was a, quote, follower and would have never thought something like this up. Mm -hmm. And Greer supposedly felt guilty and remorseful for what he'd done and had told the judge at one of his hearings, quote, I did a bad thing, Your Honor, but I'm not a bad person. I would like to apologize to Mrs. Brannon for my wrongful action, end quote. And he actually ended up pleading guilty to all five counts against him. And it's reported that his lawyer stated, quote, no plea bargain is being entered. My client recognizes his guilt, end quote. McRae, on the other hand, pled not guilty and went to trial, which was scheduled for April 25th, 1990. Which I hope the guy that admitted his guilt wasn't necessarily given a lesser sentence because what he did was still a terrible thing. Mm -hmm. But you know that his accomplice is guilty of the crime mm -hmm. and he's pleading not guilty. He should get the friggin' book thrown at him for oh, it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, okay, so you were going to con this woman whose daughter is missing 
out of $75,000 with no intent to make good on your end of the deal. Yeah. You should have to work minimum wage, barely minimum wage, waitress wage, waiter wage. $2.89 an hour or whatever it is. Yes. To make $75,000 in community service. Yeah. Honestly, I think that's pretty fair. Mm -hmm. But- There were actually a couple things that happened at the trial. So first, McRae, of course, tried to place blame elsewhere and stated that he was taking this on for some of his friends because he didn't want them to get in trouble. And then the icing on the cake of the whole thing was that he blamed Greer and said that Greer was the one who planned the whole thing out and that he supposedly desperately tried so many times to back out of it. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. But also, apparently, both men had previously confessed to attempting to get the money when they were first arrested. (laughs) So this guy's whole story is just not adding up, at least in my opinion. It's the stupid criminals, you know? Oh, absolutely. But Tammy also testified at McRae's trial about how much their actions affected her and the way they told her that they were going to harm her daughter was Mm -hmm. just traumatizing. Right. And thankfully, though, it only took the jury two hours of deliberation to convict McRae, and he was found guilty on all charges, and both he and Greer were set to be sentenced two months later in June of 1990. Both men ended up receiving prison sentences. Greer was sentenced to three years and ten months, and McRae was given a seven-year prison sentence. Good, because he was trying to, you know, throw all the burden on everybody else and saying that he wasn't guilty of the crime. Agreed, yeah. Like, no, if, if you screwed up, Even though you're relatively young, Mm -hmm. you know, fess up to the crime that you committed. Yep. And by showing that you acknowledge that you messed up, that's already a path to hopefully redemption. Absolutely. I mean, the whole point is rehabilitation. So you can see that Greer seems to already be on that wavelength. Right. Right. Where he's not going to make that mistake again. Whereas McRae is like... No, I had nothing to do with this. Uh, I'm I'm not guilty of it. It was everybody else. It wasn't me. I was begging them not to do it. Mm-hmm. Blah, blah, blah. It's like he can't even admit guilt. He can't even admit to himself mm-hmm. that what he did was messed up. So you can assume that if you had to put Greer and McRae next to each other, Greer probably won't do this again, whereas McRae probably would do it again. Yeah, but anyway, at this point, I do need to back up a little bit again. To late January of 1990 when something else took place regarding Caleb Hughes. So we hadn't talked about it before, but I do want to touch on it now. And that's the fact that Caleb Hughes had a previous criminal history. Interesting. Yeah. So it was reported that none of the charges or convictions against him had been sexual or violent in nature. I was going to ask if he was a pedophile. Yeah, he was not, at least that we know of. Yeah. So Hughes had been in prison back in 1985, and he was there for about a year for convictions related to unauthorized use of a vehicle and grand larceny. Once he was out of prison in 1987, Hughes also was convicted of contributing to the delinquency of a minor, which stemmed to him providing beer to a 15-year-old. I was going to say buying liquor for somebody and then trying to get them drunk and maybe take advantage of them. Oh, okay. I didn't. Is that like a part of that kind of charge? Or no, I'm just saying if they were, if he was aiding in the delinquency of a minor, mm. he was getting them liquor. Mm-hmm. And then if we know that at this Christmas uh, party, mm-hmm. he was all around these little kids, having them sit on his lap, doing all this weird stuff, mm-hmm. a little too touchy feely. Mm-hmm. It's not a stretch of the imagination to say he was buying liquor for this kid. Then this kid maybe ingested some of that liquor. Maybe Caleb tried to take advantage of him, even if he wasn't charged with any crimes related to that. Mm-hmm. It goes with the M.O. of saying, oh, okay, he was touchy-feely with all these young kids Mm -hmm. two years or three years later. Yep. Well, he's buying liquor for young kids then in 85. Yeah. Maybe he was trying to take advantage of them back then. Well, so it's interesting you bring that up because he was also charged with harboring youths that had run away from home. And I can't tell if it was just like one child that he had harbored or if there were multiple. But Mm -hmm. regardless, there was at least one charge for that by 1987. So, again, like he's he's surrounding himself with younger people. And that Mm -hmm. was something that has been brought up a lot in this case. And it's something that we'll touch on in part two. But he definitely was around people much younger than him very often. Right. So we know that he was convicted of some type of crime having to do with a juvenile. Mm -hmm. Then we know that he was also accused of harboring juveniles that were running away from home. Yeah. Then, when it comes to Melissa's abduction, we know that in the night that she was abducted, he was seen being touchy-feely with young kids, having them sit on his lap and all this stuff, and was probably the last person to be seen with Melissa prior to her abduction. Yeah. He may not be a pedophile, but he's, like, showing a lot of 
symptoms of a pedophile. And creepy characteristics, for sure. Right. Now, Hughes's charge for unauthorized use of a vehicle had landed him in pretty hot water, and he was given a five-year sentence with four years of that sentence to be suspended. So when he was released in 1986, he would then be on parole for that charge. So that now brings us to January of 1990, when Hughes had apparently violated the rules of his probation and had also supposedly failed to complete a substance abuse program, which had been court ordered. Well, he bought a six pack the night of Melissa's disappearance. And if he's not supposed to be drinking alcohol, he should have been violated then. Maybe that's what this stemmed from. Maybe. It's possible. And you also have to think, too, I know... My opinion on the theory that I mentioned at the end of Rosie Gordon's episode that we would kind of touch on, which unfortunately we're going to have to, you know, talk more in depth about that by the end of part two. But again, that's something that fits with the profile, an alcoholic, someone that's Mm -hmm. drinking too much, those kinds of things. So these are all things that I've like kept in the back of my mind as I've been researching this case, too. So well, also just thinking about what we're talking about now, where if he was on probation and he had to go through some type of substance abuse counseling Mm -hmm. and maybe since he got out of prison he wasn't drinking at all and then after melissa's abduction Mm -hmm. he's saying that he went and bought a six-pack we talk about characteristics of somebody that may change after some type of traumatic event yes yes well if he wasn't drinking and then all of a sudden he's going out and buying a six-pack and pounding these six beers back because maybe he just did something Mm -hmm. you know those are the types of changes in behaviors that we talked about during Rosie's case, when they're saying, hey, if you know somebody Mm -hmm. and their behaviors are changing, these are some things to look out for. Yeah, the post-offense characteristics like that. Exactly. I couldn't think of the term, but Yeah, and I didn't want to interrupt you, so, as I just kind of interrupted you, but... (laughs) (laughs) Post-offense characteristics. Yes, we're going to have to keep that term in our head. Yes. So, due to the fact that Caleb had now violated his parole, a judge sent him back to prison to serve the remaining four years of his sentence... And he was being held in the Augusta Correction Center in Craigsville, Virginia during this time. And from what I understand, and based on some early reporting on this matter, Hughes would not be eligible for release until at least November of 1990. Why he would be eligible at all is beyond me, but that's what was reported. Now, during this entire time from January to November of 1990, authorities were working on their case against Hughes. And as we talked about earlier, even though it shouldn't have been reported publicly and authorities hadn't stated so publicly, Hughes was their prime suspect and they needed to take their time to put the puzzle pieces together to be able to charge him in Melissa's disappearance. And when I was first researching this case and I found out that Hughes was going back to prison less than two months after Melissa went missing, I instantly said to myself, oh, they're totally going to take their time and methodically build this case against him. Mm -hmm. And then as I continued researching, I ran across this statement in a Washington Post article that stated, quote, according to sources, the general strategy in the case has been to let the case against Hughes strengthen over time. And there has been reluctance to charge Hughes until some trace of Melissa is found because the prime suspect was already behind bars on an unrelated charge. There was no threat to the public, the sources said, end quote. It's almost like best case scenario. As far as you know that you have a bad person out on the loose, now this person is locked up on an unrelated charge. Mm -hmm. Now it's like, okay, we were building a case against him anyway. Yep. But now we don't have to worry about him doing anything else while he's out. Or leaving the area or anything. Right. So now it's almost like we can really dig in and work on this case because we don't have to worry about him doing something again. Yes. Because he's locked away. Exactly. They can take their time. They can painstakingly go through each and every little thing that they were able to find. So during this time, investigators and the prosecutor were working on building up their case and finding any and all evidence that they could based on the search of Hughes's home, the search of his car, and witness statements provided to authorities. And side note, the prosecutor on this case would be attorney Horan, who we talked about in Rosie Gordon's case, And if you heard that episode, you'll now know that I was pronouncing his name wrong all along. So (laughs) I totally apologize for that one. I try and be really good about it, but I totally missed that one. But I assume that there probably weren't any videos referencing this person until you started looking into this case. Exactly. 
Son of a bitch. I know. As soon as he said it in the in the forensic files and the FBI files episodes, I was like, no, I can't believe I did that. I try so hard to pronounce names right because I have lived my entire life having my name either spelled or pronounced wrong. Yep. Always. So. Well, all we can do is go forward with the knowledge that we have now. Exactly. So, and be attorney better. Attorney Haran. Yes, Attorney Haran. But here's just a tiny tidbit of the evidence authorities had been able to locate and analyze since Melissa had gone missing. Back when the FBI had issued that search warrant and searched Caleb Hughes's home and car, they found the majority of the evidence in his vehicle. And early on, after the search had been conducted, media reports leaked some information, but it wasn't entirely clear exactly what investigators had at that point. However, details did come out later. So apparently there was blood found in the vehicle, on the steering wheel, the floor of the car, and on the pedals. And that blood was sent off to be analyzed. But unfortunately, what we find out later is that the luminol testing of the blood degraded the sample. So it was pretty much impossible to determine who it belonged to. And according to the FBI files episode on this case, apparently luminol can destroy the genetic characteristics of blood samples. And that kind of appears to be what happened in this case, which is super unfortunate. But I will say we will circle back to blood evidence in part two of this case. But as of now, that's what it seems like. The blood that was found, there just wasn't enough of it. And the luminol just kind of destroyed what was there. I guess that's a double-edged sword. And I wonder if it was more of an issue back in the day when you needed a larger sample of DNA or blood to test. And maybe it's not too big of a problem now Mm. because you don't need as large of a sample because they might not have found that blood without using the luminol, but by using the luminol, they destroyed the sample. Exactly. So, I mean, at least by using the luminol, you now have evidence that there was blood in the car. Mm -hmm. And if this guy has no reason to say why there was blood in the car, Mm -hmm. more evidence to build the case against Caleb. Yes. And in regards to the blood on the floor and the pedals... If you're thinking back to the shaving or cutting of the soles of his shoes, Mm -hmm. you and me both, man. And according to reporting done for the Washington Post on that subject, quote, subsequent tests determined that several pieces recently had been cut out of the shoes and that an area on the right tennis shoe of Hughes adjacent to a cut area contained human protein consistent with human blood, end quote. And what foot did most people use when they're driving? The right foot. Exactly what would be on the pedal in the area where all this blood was. Yes. Now, the more circumstantial type evidence against Hughes was that he had taken that polygraph and he'd been told he was failing it. And I believe he took a second polygraph and failed that one as well. And authorities said there were, quote, inconsistencies in his statements. But I will say that polygraphs at the time could actually be admitted to be used in court Mm -hmm. only if the defense was okay with it. Well, of course, his defense attorney would be like, my client walked out while he was doing the the polygraph and he was failing it and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so he's going to be like, absolutely not. It's not allowed in. But still, it's something to think about. It's still a part of the case, but not anything that could be used in a potential conviction if that were to come. Right. The only way I think a defense attorney would allow a polygraph in that is putting their client in a bad light, i.e. they're failing it, would be if there was some piece of that polygraph that they could use to their advantage. Yeah. Yep. So probably it, very few it and far between. It doesn't appear as though there was this one. <laughs> <laughs> it makes so, sense. Yeah. Authorities also had both hair and clothing fiber evidence against Hughes in this case. And apparently they'd had that for months, but they were working behind the scenes to link everything and just really button up and tie up all those loose ends regarding this specific evidence. And according to reporting done for the Washington Post, quote, evidence gathered against Hughes includes what police believe is fur from the coat Melissa's mother was wearing, according to sources. Police believe hair from the coat may have rubbed off on Melissa's clothing. In addition, sources said other fiber evidence linked Hughes to the case, end quote. Now, at this point, it was November of 1990. And like I mentioned before, it was possible that Caleb could have been released around this time. But just as I suspected, investigators finally bit the bullet and charged Caleb Hughes in November of 1990. But he was not being charged with murder. The charge against him was abduction with the intent to defile. 
The fact that Melissa's body had not been found by that point was the reason that a murder charge could not be brought forward. Now, you might be asking, Britt, there are no body homicide trials all the time. Well, based on Virginia law back in 1990, that charge could not be brought against Hughes because the state had the burden of proving where the murder occurred. And based on the evidence gathered, they did not know the answer to that question. And according to an Associated Press piece, quote, there is no body, and therefore you have no way of knowing that she is dead. More important, if she were killed, there's no evidence of where it would have taken place, end quote. Another comment regarding why it had taken authorities so long to charge Hughes was, quote, another reason for waiting, the sources said, was that bringing an abduction charge poses potential legal risks. If an abduction case were rejected in court, evidence from the first trial, including the fiber samples, could not be used in a second case if Melissa were to be found, end quote. Very interesting. Yes. I think even though they couldn't charge Hughes with murder, I think abduction with intent to defile is still the safer charge because during the process of that legal battle, mm-hmm. if they were to ever find her or her body, they can amend the charges after the fact. Absolutely. But you can't forget, now there are two different options here. You could charge him with abduction or you could charge him with abduction with intent to defile. And intent to defile added like a lot of years onto that sentence versus mm-hmm. just abduction. I think abduction was like 10 years as a minimum sentence. And then with the intent to defile, I think it was 30 as a minimum. Okay. So they had to make that decision. And attorney Haran had, again, that burden of proving that motive of did he actually intend to defile her? Well, why else would you abduct the kid? And that's that's definitely something that is said I think, later, for sure. Okay, and I think that the blood in the car mm-hmm. is like the nail in the coffin for choosing intent to defile because now you have the hair evidence of the fur from Tammy's coat mm-hmm. in his car when you know you had no reason for that to ever be in there. Mm-hmm. Then you have the blood in the car. You have him shaving the bottom of his right shoe off. Both shoes, I think. You have... <laughs> Even more so. Right, (laughs) regardless. Like, you have evidence of some type of wicked deed occurring Mm -hmm. in this car. Yes. And if he doesn't have any type of explanation for it, like, why would there be blood all over the floor of the car and Mm -hmm. his shoes and all that? Like, there is clear evidence that there was intent to defile. Murder may be the end result, but without evidence of that murder and with them not being able to charge that at the time... Mm -hmm. I think they made the right choice in charging abduction with intent to defile. I agree. And I think that the main thing here is because Melissa has not been found. That is a big part of the intent to defile piece of things. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't he have brought her back? People are thinking, authorities are thinking, the prosecution is thinking. Something bad must have happened. Something bad must have happened to cover up this crime, which was the intent to defile her. Right. That's what I was trying to get across and I had a hard time like with my words there. No, no, I totally get it. And with the semantics of Virginia law at the time without Mm -hmm. having the body and being able to decipher, you know, where the murder would have taken place or did take place, it makes sense to charge the intent to defile because like you said, why isn't she home? Mm -hmm. She isn't somewhere else. They can't, if he was saying, oh, you know, uh, no, I abducted her, but she's here. Yes. And pointed to there then that abduction with intent to defile charge is gone because the defense can say, yes, my client abducted her, but he didn't defile her. She's she's alive over there. Mm -hmm. With some other family. Right, but there's no evidence to her being anywhere. Exactly. And that's like the biggest thing here. And thankfully, the abduction with intent to defile charge stuck when a grand jury indicted Hughes and his trial was set to begin on February 25th, 1991. We'll be back next week to discuss in more detail all of the evidence authorities worked to gather prior to trial, the initial hearings, the trial itself, and what came out during it. And then we'll go over all the additional details that came out during testimony and everything else that transpired after. We'll see you next week. (laughs) 
Thank you all so much for tuning in every week. We're so happy to have you here. Make sure to leave us a five-star review before you go and follow us on our socials. You can follow us on Instagram at Wicked Deeds Pod and on Twitter at Wicked Deeds. Don't forget to visit our website, wickeddeedspodcast.com, to take a look at any photos from this episode and view our source material. But most importantly, tune in next week for an all-new episode. <laughs>